<clears throat> Heavenly Father, Lord, we want to thank you so much. Now, Lord, at this moment, we just humbly come before you, Lord, to ask that your Holy Spirit um, enter our hearts and our minds. Lord, um, help us to learn, Lord, and to apply what we learn today, what we see today, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> We're living in some exciting times in Earth's history, aren't we? You read the news, you, you listen to the news, you see what's going on in the world around you, and it just, it's screaming to the world that something big is about to happen. You know, and it's, it's, it's awesome, you know, when, when, when you are paying attention, when, when you are maturing spiritually, you can really see it. When there's growth going on, you can see it. I remember when I was, when the boys were little, and still no one can tell you, but whenever I'm getting ready, you know, and, you know, for example, if Anna's at work and stuff, and I'm trying to get everything ready, trying to get the boys dressed and everything like that, they know something is going on. Levi knows something is going on. And the other day, uh, Levi saw Anna putting on her scrubs, and they're back, black scrubs. And he came up to her and he says, can I go to work with you today? He knew. And, and the thing is this, as, as he is growing up, he knows something is going on. When my mom was here, um, and she was helping us watch the boys, she's done that a couple of times, but he saw me getting ready and everything, and I was, you know, I guess in a hurry and stuff, and he said, bye, pa. <laughs> I wasn't even leaving. He says, bye. I'll see you later. He knew something was going on. He knew that I was going to work. And the same thing happens when we mature spiritually, when we have spent time with God, when we are reading through the Bible, when we are spending time in prayer, we know that something is happening. There's no doubt. It's for those people who don't study the Bible. It's for the people who don't, who don't pray. For people who, it's almost like they are into themselves. They can't tell something big is about to happen. You know, it worries me. It scares me. Especially for our young people. Sometimes they don't, they can't see. Um, and it's hard because Satan is coming at them so much. And it's hard for them to see sometimes that something big is about to happen. And that's Jesus' second coming. And the same thing was going on in Jesus, or right before Jesus was born. The world was ready. The world was primed. It was perfect for Jesus to come back. The Roman Empire had taken control of Palestine, and the people were ready to be saved. The people were ready to be redeemed. The people were ready to be... Um, they wanted to be put, put on the throne of David again. They wanted the Messiah to come. They wanted the Messiah to be born. But how many people were actually waiting for him? And that's what worries me. So today we're going to look at the book of Luke in chapter 1. And here Luke is writing, and this is to Theophilus. A lot of people wonder, who is this guy Theophilus? I believe that Theophilus is the brother who believes in God. You know, that's, that's my, how I feel, that Theophilus is the brothers who believe in God. Okay, I don't know if there was an actual person that he's writing to called Theophilus. He's writing to the brethren. And he's writing, first of all, of how it all came about. So in the book of Luke, chapter 1, verse 5, it says, There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zechariah, of the division of Abijah. His wife was, his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well advanced in years. I can't imagine. I love our boys so much. And sometimes they make me want to rip out my hair. <laughs> but I love them so much. And I can't imagine to have lived to be, a, it says there that they were well advanced in years. I don't know exactly how old they were. But they couldn't have children. You know, and it, it's tough to understand sometimes, you know, because it seems like a lot, of the, a lot of the time, the people who are good, the people who are righteous before God, it almost seems like those are the people that have the hardest lives, isn't it? And it almost seems, and the Bible says, how come, why is it that the wicked prosper? But those who are righteous have the hard time. So here, Zechariah and Elizabeth, they were, it says that they were righteous before God. They loved God. They were, they were priests. He was a priest of the, of, of Abijah, and she was a descendant of Aaron. So if you wanted to look at the genealogy, if you wanted to look at the bloodline, they had a good bloodline, I guess you can say. 
And although they were righteous, although they prayed, although they consecrated themselves to God, God still had not given to them a child. It's hard to pray for something and not to hear immediately, isn't it? It's hard. You know, it's been a struggle. I'm not going to say I'm dumb because I'm not. <laughs> but I have a hard time focusing. And, you know, I've never taken any, <clears throat> any medication or anything like that. But one day, when I, was, when I was about to enter the seminary, I said, All right, Lord, no more messing around. Bachelor's was hard. I couldn't focus. I need you to do a miracle in my life. And I prayed, Lord, give me wisdom, give me knowledge, help me to focus. <laughs> help me not to daydream so much. And it wasn't easy. It was not easy. But praise the Lord, He blessed me. Now, it took effort on my part to focus, <laughs> to stop daydreaming, to stop, get off Facebook every once in a while. Wi-Fi can be a blessing, but it can be a curse at times too. Especially when you're supposed to be doing schoolwork, isn't it? <laughs> So I was there and I was praying, Lord, help me, please. And I pray every single day. I pray before class for the Lord to bless me, for the Lord to help me. And it wasn't easy. God didn't all of a sudden say, well, you know what? You're going to have the mind of a, you know, 4.0 student. And I do, you don't even have to show up to class. You can just sign your name on the piece of paper and all of a sudden you're going to know everything that's in the material. No, that's not how it happened. God allows us to go through different things. And a lot of times, God doesn't answer our prayers immediately because He wants us to grow. He wants us to really actually enjoy it sometimes when we do receive it. And I praise the Lord now because now I know that I, can, I was thinking to myself, man, God, you're not really helping me out here. I don't know what in the world this teacher is saying about paradigms in Hebrew or paradigms in Greek. But now as I look back, I say, wow, thank you, Lord, because it wasn't a piece of cake for me. But I could definitely see major progress from when I was in the seminary as compared to when I was in high school or elementary school. There's no doubt that God did a miracle. So here it says that Zechariah and Elizabeth, they had been praying for a child and they were well advanced in years and God still hadn't granted to them their prayer request. So the Bible says that it was um, Zechariah's turn to go to the, into the sanctuary and offer, or offer burnt incense before the Lord. Now, if we have studied the sanctuary, for many of us have studied the sanctuary, the incense represents the prayers, ascending to heaven, ascending to God, to His throne. I just find that very, very well matched. So Zechariah goes into the sanctuary, and he's praying not just for himself, but he's also praying for the prayers of the people. He is a represent, representative to God for His people. He is the intercessor. And I couldn't, I mean, it couldn't have been a more perfect person than Zechariah. Somebody who is broken, somebody who is hurt, somebody who, who needs God. Somebody who needs prayer. Somebody who is fervently asking for God for something. What a perfect representation of the human beings to be before God. So he's offering the, the incense. And nobody else is supposed to be there. Only one person at a time. And all of a sudden, the angel Gabriel appears to him. And the angel has a message to say to him. Listen, listen, look at verse 13. It says, But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. I mean, this is so awesome. It's such a beautiful <laughs> answer to prayer for the angel who stands in the presence of the Lord to be the one that comes directly to Zechariah and says, Zechariah, don't be afraid. I have come to tell you that your prayers have been heard and your prayer will be granted and you will name, his name, you will name him John. But you know, as I, here I am as I study the Bible and I was thinking about it. I was like, you know, that's not really fair. How long did Zechariah pray? How long did Zechariah plead before God? How many years passed by? I don't know if Zechariah had brothers or sisters or if Elizabeth had other siblings. But can you imagine the hurt that they must have had going to their nieces and nephews' birthdays? And to know that they can't have a child? What if it was in today's world? Can you imagine what it would have been for them to go to children's place or to Oshkosh? I don't know. All the other little children's stores. 
And to be picking out children's clothes and to think, man, I wish I could buy this for my child. You go to the book of, to the book of Daniel, and you go and you read Daniel chapter 9, and it's, uh, Gabriel tells Daniel, as soon as you said your prayers, as soon as you invoked on God's name, he heard your prayers, and I have come immediately. But here, years have passed. Zachariah is an old man. Elizabeth is an old woman. What this is trying to show us here is that we as Christians need to be persistent. We shouldn't base, us, us as Christians, and this shows a lot of our spiritual maturity, as Christians, we should not be basing our relationship with God on His answers to our prayers. I love my children, but I do not want to give them candy for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Do you? <laughs> Can you imagine how big those medical bills would be? Or dental bills would be? But that's what they want, right? Now, because I don't give them candy for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, does that mean that I don't love them? No. I still love them. So they shouldn't base my relation, my love towards them based on what I do for them, correct? It should be the same thing with God. My relationship with God, my love for God should not be based on what God does for me. That's what the Jews did in Jesus' time. They were trying to base, all right, if you really are the Messiah, what did they say? Do a sign for us. They were basing who God Jesus was. They were basing Jesus' Messiahship on what he could do for them. And that's wrong. That shows major, major spiritual immaturity. Our relationship with God should be based on just who He is. Not, mean, not depending on what He does for us. Here, years have passed and still Zechariah is praying. And here it says that he was praying to God. What is he praying for? I believe that he was still praying for a son. I believe that he was still persistent, that he still had faith that God could give him a son. It was hard. But Zechariah continued to do this. You all know, we, you know we've, we've studied the Bible, we've heard sermons on this, for a woman not to be able to have a child, or for a man not to be able to bear a son. To them, you were cursed. You had done something against God. And now this person who, who is a spiritual leader, <laughs> for people to think, well, you know, something's wrong in this man's life. Something's wrong with this woman's life. That's why God hasn't given them a son. Why is he my representative? Why is he the high priest? Why is he the priest? I mean, I just can't imagine what it must have been like for them. So then we continue to, to study and see what goes on in Zechariah. So Zechariah, what does he do? Does he believe immediately? No. What was the purpose of this son? Every time that, that an angel comes to announce the birth of someone, it's because that child has a specific purpose. Every single time. You see it with, with Isaac. You see it with Samson. You see it with Cyrus in the book of Isaiah. You see it with Jesus. Every single time that an angel announces a birth is because that child is special. Look at uh, verses 16 and 17. Listen, listen to what Gabriel says to, to Zechariah. and says, And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. When we go to the very last verses of the book of Malachi, it says that in the last days, or in the, the this is the, the dreadful day of the Lord, or when something big is happening for God, that God would send his servant Elijah to be able to prepare the way for the Lord. Now, what, what, what this means, when we look at Scripture, when we study the, 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 the life of Elijah, Elijah's major purpose in life was to bring back the nation of Israel from its heathen ways, to the worship of the one true God. That was his purpose. That was his job. That was his ministry. And I can't imagine how difficult that must have been. Now, here, this little baby, it says that he will go out with the power of Elijah as well. So what was his purpose in life? To prepare the way for the Lord. To prepare the way for Jesus' second coming. When we go to the book of John chapter 1, we see how John is preaching of, to repentance. John is preaching to be ready for the Messiah, to be ready for Jesus to return again. So here we find that John, is, his birth is not just a common birth. His birth is not just something unimportant. It is extremely important. Now in the same way that John's birth was, was, was announced, in the same way that John's uh, 
life had a special purpose in life was because Jesus was to be born. He was supposed to prepare everyone, supposed to tell everyone, let everybody know something big is about to happen. We also, as Seventh-day Adventists, believe that we are also the, I guess you can say, we're supposed to be spit, uh, filled with the spirit of Elijah as well. Now the thing is this, we know that Jesus Christ is coming soon, correct? And we know, we, we, we have studied, the, we just got done with the uh, series on Daniel and Revelation. We know absolutely where we stand in the timeline and we're somewhere in the toes, but are we preaching that Jesus is coming soon? Are we preparing the way? Are we calling people back to the worship of the one true God? There are many people out there who are hurting. There are many people out there who are lost, many people who don't feel like they have meaning for life, they don't have a purpose for life, they don't have direction in life. And God has called us, just like He called John, to prepare people to meet their Savior, to meet Jesus Christ. So here, can you imagine how awesome it must have been Gabriel has just quoted those last few verses of the Old Testament to Zechariah. And Gabriel has just told Zechariah, Zechariah, your child has a tremendous burden on his shoulders. He's not even born yet, and he already has a plan for his life. His plan is to tell people that the Messiah is coming soon. So when we go back to, now if we continue to read verses 18 through 20, we find what happens. It says, and Zechariah said to the angel, how shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is well advanced in years. And the angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God, and was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings. Behold, you will be mute and not able to speak until the day these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their own time. So what happened to Zechariah? Although Zechariah was righteous, Although Elizabeth was righteous, does that mean that they were perfect? No. What happened with Zechariah? He didn't believe. So here he is praying for something for years, for years, probably for decades. And when God finally answers his prayer, it says that he didn't believe. An angel came to him to tell him, God is going to answer your prayers. And Zechariah still didn't believe. That's not faith, is it? <laughs> Maybe God answered their prayer request because of Elizabeth's prayers, not so much on Zechariah's prayers. I don't know. But the thing is this, we need to understand, we need to learn that when we pray, even if it takes years, even if it takes decades, we need to pray with faith. And we need to be expecting an answer from God. An answer. That doesn't mean that it's always going to be a yes. But we need to be expecting an answer from God. Zechariah was not ready. Zechariah was not expecting an answer from God. What was his punishment? To be mute. Can you imagine how difficult that must have been? If you look at the Aramaic, if you look at the Hebrew writing, it isn't easy. It isn't like the English writing where you could just, you know, write in cursive. It's a pain. You had to do all kinds of little squiggly lines and a whole bunch of little dots and yeah, if you know how to read it, it can, it can become easy. But to write it, it takes forever. That was his punishment because he didn't believe in God, because he didn't believe that this angel had been sent from God to deliver this specific message. But listen to verses 23 to 25. It says, So it was, as soon as the days of the service were completed, and he departed to his own house. Now after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived. And she hid herself five months, saying, Thus the Lord has dealt with me. In the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among my people. So here is John. Here's the announcement to John's birth. Here the people in the nation of Pal in the land of Palestine, they are primed. They are ready for Jesus to come back. They're ready for the Messiah, I'm sorry, to return or to arrive for the first time. Major things were happening in the world at that time. The world was perfectly set up for Jesus to return or to arrive, I'm sorry. They had a, 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 an empire that touched most of the places of the earth. They had a language that was common around the world. They had a written language as well that was common around the places of the world. So that this way the scripture, the, the, the message of the Messiah could be preached faster to everyone. 
the world was ready for Jesus to arrive there. And it was John's specific purpose, even before he was born, as a baby, his, his job already, his suit was laid out, his tools were handed to him, and his job was to prepare the people for Jesus. It's the same thing that we're going through right now. The world right now is ready. The world right now is anxious to be delivered from this miserable world. You know, there's, there's people that are afraid of World War III and what could happen if, if World War III were to break out. Let me ask you all a question. Can World War III happen? It can happen. It doesn't take much for a war to break out. World War III can happen. How many countries now have nuclear weapons? Many of them. Can you imagine what would happen if a world war was to happen again? What happened at the last world war? We dropped two atomic bombs on Japan. What would happen if we were to enter a world again? You look at the food source, and you look at the, the people in the world that are hungry. The United States is consuming most of the food of the world. We produce a lot of it, but we're consuming it all too. The natural resources are, are running out. Everything, everything is pointing to the people, letting them know. And really the world is asking the question for, the, for everyone. Do you really want to continue to live like this? Do you really want to continue to live in a world like this? The answer is supposed to be no. God has allowed all these things to happen. God has set up time so that at the right and perfect time, for Jesus to return for a second time. So I'm going to be doing a series this month, being that it's Christmas. We're going to be talking about the people that were around when Jesus came for the first time. And I want us to really think about this, because the thing is this, so many of us as Seventh-day Adventists, generational Adventists, and it's awesome to know that here there are not that many generational Adventists. A generation, generational Adventist is somebody like me. Second, third, or fourth generation. I'm fourth generation Adventist. And a lot of times we take this for granted, just like the Jews did back then. We think to ourselves, well, I'm, uh, my grandpa was a preacher. Oh, my dad was a lay, lay member in, in Mexico. Oh, well, this and that. That doesn't matter. And a lot of times we take the message that we have as the Seventh-day Adventist Church, we take it for granted because we think we know it all. Yeah, we say, yeah, Jesus is coming soon. Yeah, Jesus is coming soon. Yeah, Jesus is coming soon. But the question is, are we ready? Have we prepared ourselves for Jesus to return? Have we surrendered to Him like we are supposed to for Jesus to return? The world at that time was not ready. They were, they were wanting one, but they weren't looking for one. Our job, just like John's job, is to let everybody know that the Messiah is coming soon. That is our job. Okay, so let's, let's pray. And let's ask that the Lord can help us to complete this mission. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just want to thank you so much for this beautiful story, Lord, of Zechariah, Lord, and Elizabeth, who were so faithful to you. Lord, I can't imagine how, how hard it must have been, Lord, to pray for years for something and not to hear anything back. But Lord, at the right time, at the perfect time, you delivered a message to them that they would have a child, and that that child would be extremely, extremely special. Lord, we know that Jesus is coming again. Lord, and a lot of times we can just take it for granted, just like the Jews did in Jesus' time. They took it for granted, thinking to themselves that they had the bloodline, that they had been chosen by God. They had been chosen by you, Lord, that all of a sudden that the Messiah would be born in a palace, and he wasn't. Lord, help us to be ready. Help us to be searching the Scriptures. Help us to be preaching the Word to others. Doing what you have asked us to do. To prepare the way for Jesus to return again. Lord, that is our prayer. In Jesus' name, Amen.